Hello and welcome to the Silver Sentinels. In this mini-series, we are going over a region of my world with a fine-tooth comb. Today, we'll get deep into a region called Pram. We'll cover all the particulars. Nomenclature, statistics, demographics, cosmology, history, archaeology, ethnicity, whew, zoology, physics, and so much more. This is going to take the entirety of episodes 2, 3, and 4, because Pram has it all. My name is Lewis Nichols, and I've been around gaming since way before it was cool. I've published an RPG, owned my own collectibles business. I've even published a few short stories. Check out Amazon if you don't believe me. I don't claim to know everything about everything, but when it comes to world building, you can trust me. When I first started working on Pram, I had this idea. One episode for one continent. That didn't really work out. There's too much in Pram to deal with. It's a lot of stuff. A lot of space, a lot of people, a lot of interesting things going on. So, it's not going to work out. That's okay. We will adapt. What I am going to do, split it up. We're going to start down in the southeast. We're going to move up to the north. And then we're going to hit the southwest. In this episode, we're going to do a lot of place names, some travel destinations, some interesting stuff. Later, we will work more with culture, get into all the details. Today, get ready for place names and governments. It's going to be fun. Everybody loves this stuff, right? And don't worry, if you think we're covering stuff too thin, there's going to be bonus episodes too. And those, oh, we're going to get down to the nitty gritty. Nitty, 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 nitty gritty. You're going to love it. It's going to be so much pram. You're going to be digesting it like Thanksgiving and Christmas and Easter stuffed all together. You're going to get so much fantasy world building trip to fan in your system. I'm going to put you right to sleep. And this is going to be a long one. So grab a snack, grab something to drink, and enjoy. It's going to be great. Let's start by spitting out some factoids. I've always found that's a good way to stay grounded. Cue the music, run the slideshow. Yikes. Okay, how much of that was really necessary? Uh, let's see here. When the Silver Sentinels rose from the seas between Rothius and Marikoth, Pram was the first to be sculpted by the overseeing gods. Elves, humans. I know, always with the damn humans. There were lizard men, dwarves, gnomes, minotaur, and orcs. Little snap of the divine fingers, and they just came into existence. Now, mind you, these were not the first iterations of these species on the planet, just new populations, ethnically distinct. By the end of its first age, Rispy and Monkey had migrated from the east, Tagara and Pterodon from the north, and Brownies from the east. Not only did the number of Velito increase, they became diverse in ethnicity. In the second age of Pram, the peoples flourished, Previously, much of the zone had been settled, but few populations grew strong enough to survive the darkness in any sense of organization. Now, Velito swept forth to establish themselves throughout the northern half of the continental zone. Still, Pram remained dominant throughout, despite challenges from competing populations on Rukani, Asamimne, Shada, Drada, which will henceforth be shortened to Asamimne, or just Aussie. Frankly, I can't believe I got the pronunciation right without a dozen takes. On a side note, don't name things you can't possibly pronounce, unless you've got a great nickname ready to go. Hello, Aussie. 
As the third age dawns, Pram has become ancient. Cities are built on the ruins of grander times. The stones remember what is possible, even if those who build with them do not. The continent is poised to become a religious, cultural, and economic powerhouse. Already, powerful trade guilds ply the seas in longships and galleys, led by the priests of sea gods. The arts of ziblich, alchemy, and enchantment are all blooming into their optimistic infancy. Yet it may all be for naught. Word spreads of a terrible threat in the south. Perhaps it has already encompassed the old colonies, seated in distant times, forgotten and only recently rediscovered. The coming years may see the greatest struggle the peoples of Pram have ever known in their 8,000 years of existence. This is already an unusual age in that Celt aggression, rooting all the way back to the previous era, has allowed for more invasive participation of various powerful beings subject to the rules of the celestial hierarchy. Both heavenly and demonic beings have been able to push their agendas early in the new age. Where the rebirth of pantheons might have squashed these machinations in another age, they are now being encouraged as a bulwark while native adventurers grow strong enough to face the outsiders. In 2067, that's by the old Celt calendar, Pram is not the most populated continent in the region, but it is the most diverse and the most developed. Several complex states exist, including a highly centralized monarchy. There are two constitutional oligarchies, and a number of enlightened autocracies. Peace is fragile, but it does exist, and the peoples there are well suited for advancement considering how early it is in the age. This peace is largely maintained by three non-state actors. The Merku Trade Union controls the biggest portion of shipping throughout the continental zone. To this end, they strive to limit conflicts while balancing a trade in arms. However, their primary business is the transport of lumber, silver goods, and tea. The Ascendian Order is the second of these powerful groups. They are an association of like-minded warriors. These men are of high ideals seeking peace and prosperity for the sake of it. Losses at the hands of the Merku have stunted their development, but their knights and clerics are still highly influential in the regional politics and law enforcement. In the latter regard, their ethical code is often considered to supersede laws from the local government. The last important group is the Loridian Confederacy. This league of mercenary warriors not only goes where the money is, but wields political and economic power due to their ability to be selective in taking work. The contracts they accept or decline can affect the balance of power on the regional scale. Before the Celt invasion of Aussie, the Confederacy was one of the most powerful of the three. Over a five-year period, they have gained major concessions from the Merku in exchange for their aid in the rivalry against the Ascendian Order. Recently, however, the Confederacy has taken enormous losses in battles against the Celts. A seagoing, adventuring culture began rising from the Dark Age in the late 2050s, only about ten years ago. There are many reasons the rise of heroes has been slow to coalesce. Primary among these is the simple fact the age only technically began in 2066, when the first indigenous priests were gained spells. Having a hundred hit points is all well and good until you have to heal without aid of a priest or alchemy. The lack of adventuring infrastructure in the north and the lack of civilization in the south led many of the region's warriors to the far north and adventurers east in the years where they were becoming powerful. This was encouraged by local governments as a way to remove threats of young, skilled fighters from their lands. With the rise of real threats, they have slowly been returning to their homeland, but this is a slow process and the distances are vast. Pram is an area of many regions that vary in nearly every descriptor. As it's one and a half million square miles of landmass, it must be divided into many pieces to fully consider. What can be said as a whole is limited. There are no deserts and little volcanic activity, at least for now. The whole continent is moving north like three bumper cars smashing their way to colder weather. Realistically, some deity or set of deities will mix things up again before natural geology has time to do much. But one should expect a consistent yearly risk of earthquakes and eruptions, along with a one in a thousand year shot of a bigger, prolonged disturbance. 
Of course, something like that needs to be planned by the world builder, not rolled randomly. I think if Future Dresden ever has a story thread this far north, it's probably going to coincide with some rumbly, grumbly, lava-spitting mountains. The climate is warm, roughly equivalent to the southern United States. The far north can see snow in the winter. However, the majority of the population only rarely knows a freeze, except at elevation. The land is mostly uneven, prone to the hill country. Exposed rock, gullies, and depressions. Lakes, rivers, and ponds, streams, they're all common. However, a few large areas of smoothified terrain are present. Where mountains occur, they are maturing, but not yet old. Most are forested, but full of rock faces and dangerous slopes. They range around 9,000 feet, with the tallest in the east at 12,000. Shores tend to be rocky, and low seaside cliffs are common. Partially due to the uneven terrain, there are many excellent natural ports. Weather-wise, Pram is not in the danger zone for facing major storms on a regular basis, and its weather is pleasantly predictable in most years. Perhaps once in 10 years, the southeast will see a tropical storm, and one in 50, a legitimate hurricane. Average rainfall is 30 inches, more in the east, less in the west. Locally, parts of the east are referred to as the cloudy coast. The interior can get tornadoes, sometimes big ones. Lightning gets a few people every year, but the most dangerous weather is hail. Most years, areas prone to it get a couple small storms, but one in ten years, an event might be much worse. The grandparents around Oja often remind their descendants of the day boulders fell from the sky. Culture on Pram dictates settlement as much as geography. Most of the northern 60% of the continent is considered holy land that should be kept pure and unsettled. Travel is permitted, but anything more than a tent will draw scrutiny. Still, for those staying close to home, it is the foundation of the area's adventuring tradition. Restriction on development is not without its naysayers. The central hill country has been the site of several new camps and may be the wedge that ends the prohibition. Other exceptions will be noted as appropriate. All right, let's zoom in. Let's start looking at the particulars. For this episode, we'll hang out here. Let's see what kind of trouble we can get into. The entire southeast quadrant of Pram is referred to in many circles, including ours, as Velveeta. This is primarily because of the Velveeta Mountains. But it's also because the region's many colonies came to know their homeland by that name. While their neighbors to the west were settling Imaset on the continent of Osamemne, the peoples of Elveta put down colonies in that continent's central regions and parts of Tarok. Now, Valveta is an old reference, so this is tenuous at best. Fresh out of the Dark Age, all of about a month ago, the people of Tarok remember Valveta as a mythical homeland. Finding out it was real was one of the many spiritual validations that jump-started local religions. Valveta literally means northern home in one dialect. On Aussie, an ancient map still exists, etched in stone. The map is fairly accurate, but hardly reliable for sailing. It did point out Valveta, and that was enough to teach the peoples of Aussie the world was bigger than their single island, beefy as it might be. Framing it in, we've already mentioned the Valvetti mountain chain to the north. The western part of that chain is often referred to as the Minor Valvetti or Surman Mountains. The eastern seaboard is the Gedalian Coast, notable for its coral reefs and high frequency of sharks. Also remarkable is its severe coastline. It's all pretty rough, but there were some seriously pissed off earth spirits that put this stretch together. Over the 150 miles of seafront, there are some sections of pleasant sloping beach, but shoreside cliffs are more common. Most are not extreme in height, merely 5 to 20 feet, and in a few places, especially in the north, there are more significant features with 100-foot bluffs shooting right up out of the water. The southern shore is less angry over most of its long run, as is the western side. The south is marked on many maps as the Hebrain with western portions beyond Moonshine Bay, often referred to as the Willowy Coast. The far western coast of Valveta is known strictly by that name. Politically, the west is dominated by the nation of Surman. Brickwater Bay is home to the twin cities of Real and Gino. 
Moonlit Bay is organized into the Moonlit Confederacy. Their reach, however, does not extend up the Moon River. Instead, it's the Kingdom of Ossery that extends up its shores, and all the way up on Dry Castle Lake, that's Aussie Lumina. The middle river of the region is the Cane. These are the lands of two small tyrannies, Bovino and Araconi. At their head, on Lake Ubitten, is the small nation of Crado. The Cane is the least stable area of Valvetta, with many riverside villages well outside the reach of any government. Continuing east, we find the largest nation of the region. Termini de Rey is a weak monarchy primarily ruled by powerful business interests and local strongmen. However, the current elven king has so far done well to play them against each other and maintain power. North of Termini de Rey, we have the lower Lusani River and the coast. It's home to the Hajif Hazim monarchy, with several small city-states on the river farther inland. The kingdom of Hajif Hazim is going to be the location of our first bonus episode as we look at a small village on the Gedalian coast. Make sure you like and subscribe so you can catch this and all the upcoming episodes. Whew, that's a lot of names. Truthfully, any of these could be expanded into its own episode. It's easy to imagine an adventure on the Lusani River. Political intrigue, economic opportunity, and the vast, deep wilderness just a few weeks travel away. Speaking of, this is one of those hot spots that threatens to overthrow the status of the Holy Lands all out of kilter. See that bay? Yeah, that's a nice looking bay, isn't it? Both Trimini Dere and Hajif Hasim agree with you. They've had their eyes on it for a while now. Several camps have been broken up recently, and the capital of Hajif Hazim has even seen clashing opinions turn into riots. Yeah, it's right up there with public speaking and spiders. People hate naming things. They worry that the terminology that they pick is not going to be up to snuff. Well, let me tell you something. It is. For the record, I'm using place names inspired by the towns and cities in western India for Pram. I'm not stealing their culture. It's just a general feel for the language, for the sake of uniformity. When it comes to geography-related nomenclature, like the bays, I just use English. That's what I speak. That's what you guys speak. And if that's not what you speak, I do apologize. I'm sure I'm giving a fit to whatever translation software you're using. I've never had a problem throwing down a moonlit bay next to a Suriname. I do what makes sense. If it doesn't grow on me, you can change it later. Now we're going to talk a lot about nomenclature in some future episodes in this series. But for now, that's my advice to you. Be brave. Put some letters together. Make a name. And let it percolate over time. Like I said, if it doesn't work out, you can change it later. But at least you've got a starting point now. And now, the Demigorgon. That doesn't seem... Oh, demographics. Yeah, we're talking about demographics now. That makes a lot more sense. Uh, populations on Valvetta are mixed. That is a norm for the entirety of my creation. Smaller populations are more likely to be segregated for simple reproductive reasons. If you have a town of 100 people and 10 different races, it's hard to find a girlfriend. Sometimes it's... Never mind, we won't go into that. Uh, so, going to flash some numbers on the screen. You might see them already. These numbers constitute the averages for all of Alveda and will hold generally true for the larger towns and cities. A few quick thoughts to let you recover from all that data. First of all, I know you guys probably don't recognize all the species that I've listed. What the heck is a mamlac? Well, don't worry, that's all going to be explained later. Believe me, I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about race and ethnicity. If you're running 5e, you can substitute your own creatures, your own races, into this easily. All the standard stuff from D&D &D will get along just fine on Pelicar. Now, what is the difference between a tyranny and an autocracy? For the most part, this is my own definition, so don't try to use it in your political geography class. A tyranny is mostly controlled by a single leader who took the position by power. He makes decisions for the state with very little bureaucratic help. 
In an autocracy, it's much more involved, slightly more complicated. Street-level decisions are made by functionaries of the state. Autocracies are more likely to be more militaristic, while tyrannies look inward. Tyrannies will more likely grow into monarchies, while autocracies will devolve into oligarchies. The economy of Velveta is simple, based entirely on gold. Several states mint coins, including Surman, Trimini Dure, and Bovino. These are the top three. In a campaign setting, I wouldn't muddle it up too much. Oh, but what we could do... Let's use the gold pieces of Trimini Dure as our standard. These coins are minted with the king on one side and the head of a drake on another. As such, they are often just called drakes. Functionally, most transactions are conducted in pennies, also minted in gold. Each gold penny is about a quarter of a drake, or six silver bits, as minted by the Kelds. Finally, there are copper coins, called squids. They are very common among the common folks, as a hundred of them will make up a gold drake. Oh, but if you're a fisherman paying for a clay water jar, just try getting change for that fancy drake at the market. Meanwhile, the rate of the drake will usually fall outside of Termini Dure because people just don't trust it as much. It's not the local currency. It's not locally minted. It could be anything. If the value falls too much, people will start melting them down because raw gold gets you more per pound. The next thing you know, governments are making it illegal to destroy coins or trade in unmarked gold. It can really get muddy really quick. It can be an entire political incident, an economic wrinkle to the game that we love so much. Your coin can be more or less valuable depending upon where you go and inflation can become an issue. You start to value bartering and other bookkeeping skills like never before. On the other hand, most people will consider rules like this to be too much of a pain in the ass and ignore them entirely, just like the encumbrance rules. If you want to split the difference, make one roll when the characters enter a new city and make that the local markup for the visit. If they have a barterer type, they can shave off 10% as long as the barterer is around. Keep in mind, this complication can add to plot lines. Maybe the mission is to disrupt a neighboring economy and drive up inflation. Maybe it's to recruit someone's university-trained exchequer or poach one from the next town over. Keep roads open, defeat monsters who threaten trade, keep bandits at bay. By Odin, this could be a whole campaign. And while we're talking about economics, in case I haven't mentioned it yet, silver is a lousy means of transaction in the zone. In most parts of the world, a standard gold piece will get you 20 silver bits. In the Sentinels, you're looking at 30. The stuff is just as common as brass candlesticks in an antique store. That's pretty common. All right, that wraps it up for the economy. Like I said, simple. Time to zoom in a little bit more. Let's talk about some geography of note. First off, the bays. Valveda is home to two large bays, Moonlit and Brickwater. We can include the Gedalian coast here. It has to be included as the body of water is somewhat protected from nature's fury. Barrier islands offer a breakwater and a block against the dangers of deep waters. All three share nearly identical conditions. They are all heavily settled along the coast and in areas for some distance inland. The waters within are protected, hence calm and home to many activities. Both small boat fishing and shore fishing is common. Many of the beaches attract locals looking to cool down, and a few are actually vacation spots for the rare members of society who can get away. The water is too shallow for the mega predators. Due to heavy fishing keeping the food sources in check, even smaller predators are relatively rare. Sea snakes are a danger along with stingrays. Even in calm water, drowning is a hazard. Though usually causing only injury, sharp cuts on coral are common. Don't forget, this is fantasy. The occasional monster will be lurking about. Just to remind everybody, this isn't the Gulf of Mexico. It's Pelicar, and you can never rule out that something dangerous is waiting in your very near future. Well, that's the bays and the coast. What about those rivers? They look pretty impressive. Moon River runs for about 150 miles. It's deep enough to float a seaworthy galley. 
For this reason, it's not unheard of for whales and other ocean life capable of surviving fresh water to swim upriver, sometimes all the way to Drycastle Lake. In fact, there is a population of dwarf greys, not to be confused with grey dwarves, who have called the body of water their own. The Lusani is navigable, but only becomes so after the falls at Rishu, just where it makes that wild turn to the west. And that hairpin 180 degree turn is not for the faint of heart in anything bigger or less maneuverable than a coastal raider. If this river existed on Earth, it's guaranteed to be a hot spot for YouTube travel videos, especially as it winds its way around the high hills that separate it from Termini Dure. Right in the middle, we have the Cane. Winding down from Lake Ubitten, the river becomes manageable to large river ships where its biggest tributary meets up. For 200 miles, barges and sails carry everything from silver goods to soap up and down the river, stopping at the many small ports along the way. All of these rivers support large populations and can grow to support even more. Fish are plentiful, and in most areas, land is workable to farms and to ranches. Swinging back to the north, we have the Velvetti Mountains. These are significant on a continental scale. Pram's tallest peak is here, Mount Crusader, religiously important to the Ascendian Order. Not that anyone has measured it, but with my perspective as the Supreme Being, I can tell you it is exactly 11,892 feet, 3 inches, above sea level, and it will get a little snow this year. The average height of the range's 10 highest peaks is close to 10,000. That's on par with the Canadian Rockies if you're keeping track. There is gold up there, and silver, of course. In the rivers below, the former can be panned. Back on the slopes, stands of trees are rare as they are harvested as quickly as they are found. There are those who claim the mountains should be protected as holy ground, actually expanding the protected region. To date, they have yet to be able to do anything about it. Granite is quarried here, and gemstones usually found with gold occur in great quantities. Volcanic stones and gems are equally common. Exactly where any of these deposits may be found requires research and surveys. Skills in geology, mountainology, mountainology, oh, mountain survival, and mineral lore might all be helpful. Cave systems are present, but not extensive. There is no entry to the underneath here. What cave systems exist are generally accessible by armed parties of adventurers with only the occasional need for real caving builds to explore. Okay, how about next we talk about Dry Castle Lake? That's this one here. The lake is named for ancient fortifications along its eastern shore nestled into the Velvetti Mountains. Currently inaccessible due to hosting a colony of thunder drakes. Go, go, thunder drakes. The ruins appear to be extensive, possibly even extending into the mountain itself. Turrets and battlements stretch across a thousand-foot swath of Mount Kufont. The first layer runs just above the high water mark, overlooking the remains of the old docks. The second sits behind and above that one as the slope climbs behind it. Finally, the last is a full 150 feet above the lake level, partitioning off a shelf just before sheer cliffs shoot skyward. So far, it's Intrepid Adventurers 3, Drake's 17, with four more heroes killed in mountaineering accidents not directly associated with the reptiles. However, that's not really why the lake is important. I mean, it's cool and all, drakes and castles and... All right, I nerded out a bit, had to cut some of it out, went on for a while. Just, it's okay. Uh, did we mention this is a really big freshwater lake? My script here says that on Earth it would be the 13th biggest, coming in at my highly scientific estimate of 8,000 square miles. It's bigger than Lake Ontario, but smaller than Lake Winnipeg, neither of which are known for their Drake population. <laughs> Dry Castle is pretty deep, average around 500 feet, though Ontario bottoms out deeper at 800. Pretty damn deep for a lake, I might say. The important thing about Dry Castle, yeah, I know, I'm finally getting the point. 
No wonder this episode is over length by a mile. The important thing is that it's one of the major catalysts for the continental cultural debate over the status of the North, which we've touched on multiple times. We'll delve much deeper into the subject in the next episode, actually. You know, the one that's actually about the North. And now, the Iriani. Yeah, it's another Drake. One of the reasons reptiles are more common in the Sentinels goes right along with reasons mammals are less common. One of these is a bestial drake called the Iriani. They are dangerous winged hunters drawn to kill unintelligent mammals. They will consume as a normal predator would, but will also kill just for the pleasure of it. Further, while they do not crave the death of Leto or other intelligent species, they will gladly kill them to achieve their goals, even at great risk to themselves. The Iriani is distinctly reptilian, but with a few feathers around the eyes and along the spinal ridge. They are somewhat crocodilian in appearance, but with a thinner head, and, well, they fly. Iriani may be encountered alone or in packs. Won't you take me down to the moonlit bay where the crawdads sing and the jellyfish play? Yeah, I gotta stop doing that. I'm gonna drive off my very few subscribers. Moonlit Bay is the home of three forms of bioluminescent life. The Drevershik fish glows in shades of oranges, reds, and yellows during the mating season. This usually overlaps with the volcano coral's fertility season, when it spits out powdery seeds that spread along the coastal waters for miles. Finally, the Puramapur fantail. Holy cow, that's a name. That's why you don't shy away from naming stuff. Every once in a while you knock one out of the park. The Puramapur fantail. Oh, it's a large game fish. It's up to six feet long. It is most active at the end of the season of light. Yeah, that's when all this stuff is glowing. It has luminescent blues and purples shining off the tips and ends of its tail and fins. The season of light is a culturally and religiously important time of the year in the bay. It affects the local architecture. Bright colors are used as often as possible in order to show their affinity with the sea they depend on. The Singing Wist Vales There is a place about halfway up the moonlit river where the tall grass prairies have been taken over by Wist Vales. The breed of grass is similar to pampas, but intertwines as it grows to heights of 15 feet. When the wind is just right, the grass will whistle and hum as the air passes through. At times, it seems to take on a hymn, like a thousand quiet voices in song. The Drevershik and Nights in the Shining Valley At the end of their mating season, mature Drevershik females will go up the river in large numbers. In a lucky year, this will coincide with the right winds to create a magical moment when the wist veils sing next to a river glowing with spawning fish. The beauty of the scene is said to bring tears to the eyes of the hardest dwarves. The Steps to Forever Near the Sunny River's headwaters, a set of steps are hewn into the stone. One can follow them for miles, occasionally coming to a surviving stone bridge or the remnants of one where it once crossed a raging river. Thousands of these steps have been found running up into the mountains, through rough terrain, and across gentle slopes. In places they run for miles, looking to have only weathered a generation before disappearing from sight. Eventually they reappear a few miles later. Most say the end of the path has yet to be found. Others say it's still being built, but by what, no one can agree. Maybe those stairs are a metaphor for my world, still under construction. I got a long way to go. I've already done a lot too, but who knows how long the insanity will go on. I'm going to try to get these next couple of episodes out concerning Pram as soon as I can. Next episode, we're going to the north to visit the great beasts that wander those lands and the incredible vistas contained within. I am so glad each and every one of you dropped by. If you can, hit the like button, leave a comment, 
That means a lot to me. It means a lot to the station. Even if you don't, that's okay. You've already done the most important thing. You showed up, and that makes me smile. I'm looking forward to doing it again. Let's meet back on Pram. Until then, I hope you all have a great day. Cheers.